There is data <clears throat> that came from an online grocer named uh, it's Fresh Direct. And uh, what they found out is that there are many customers who, guess what? They fail to keep their New Year's resolutions, right? The retailer uh, recently reported that customers' liquor and wine consumption picked up about 40% in the first two weeks of February. So everybody says, we're not going to do. By February, they're done. We're, we're doing. We're going back. While juice, this whole juice cleansing process, you know, I'm going to drink this, I'm going to cleanse out, I'm going to do a body cleansing. Juice cleansing sales, they dropped uh, by 25%. Shoppers also bought 15% more ice cream. Yay. Um, and desserts. 35% bought more pizza. Can't complain, right? in early February than those first two weeks of January. And there's another study that was done by a group called Foursquare and Swarm. It shows that on average, by like February 4th, 37 days approximately after New Year's, that's the day most people are likely to fall off the wagon. So here's what I want you to do. Get out your calendars. Circle February 4th, that's the danger day. Okay, That's the danger day, all right? Um, the app kind of analyzes uh, users' check-ins, and they found that date really marks kind of an uptick in visits to fast food joints and then downturn in trips to, like, the gym, all right? In his book, <clears throat> A Journey to Bethlehem, Jason Sorosky offers the following definitions of the word resolutions. How many of you made, resol you made resolutions, you New Year's resolutions? Uh, some of you, you know, right? But this is what Jason uh, Sorosky writes. He says, Webster defines the word as being marked by firm determination. And the word dominates every New Year's Eve, right? To the musician, a resolution is a harmony line. It moves from a dissonant tone, one that really kind of sounds off from the melody, to a consonant tone, one that fits. Harmonics can dance and they amaze us with various uh, complexities for a while, but they must eventually resolve. You know something that I didn't realize, and musicians in this room can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think the way that it's supposed to work musically is that the first note of the song is how the song's supposed to end. So that first note is how the song ends, the same note. Which, that's how it resolves. It's amazing. And to the writer... A resolution is the end of a story, the final element maybe of a twisting plot that's got this conflict, and, but it's finally resolved to an ending where all is well. To the chemist, it's the separation of a chemical compound back into its constituents or the simplest parts of the compound. And to the statesman, resolution is an expression of the determined will of an elected body. And to the graphic artist, it's the sharpness of the pixel count on a screen, the quality of the image that's produced. That's what resolution means. And by any definition, a resolution is characterized by a return to simplicity, a focus on sharp definition, determination, and broken down into its simplest, most harmonious parts. Because, see, without resolution, art, science, government, and life in general they fall into chaos. Without resolution, there's no foundation on which to stand. And most of us, most of us end up breaking any New Year's resolutions we make, and then we feel bad. It's not that we don't want to keep them, because we do. I'm sure most of us, many of us have made resolutions in the past that we really kind of have a hard time keeping. But here's what I want you to take home. Here's what I want you to take home today. If you want to know what it means to be resolved for life. The young nobleman of the nation of Israel, Daniel, is a great example of what it means to make a resolution that sticks. If you've read uh, the book of Daniel, you read where the nation of Israel is taken captive. They've taken over by a foreign country. And the king of that country, Nebuchadnezzar, has anybody ever heard that name, Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar is how it's kind of 
uh, spelled out. But Nebuchadnezzar, he's decided that Daniel's people, the Israelites, they're going to be just like his people. He's going to turn all the Israelites into Babylonians. That's the plan, right? Nebuchadnezzar is going to teach the Israelites to dress, to eat, to live, to follow all the religious customs of the Babylonians, and they're going to do it whether they like it or not. That's the deal. And in order to accomplish this, he has the best and the brightest of the young Jewish men selected to be trained in the Babylonian ways. And his reasoning was this. He thought that if he could get these select few to become just like all of his people, the rest of the nation that was captured, they just follow along. So, this is what we read. But Daniel, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. A little bit later on in that same chapter, we read, this is what Daniel says. He says, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So uh, he agreed to do this and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier, and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. The thing I want you to see as you look forward to this new year is that in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, Daniel makes a resolution. This whole thing about Daniel being resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official, for permission. He asked them for permission not to eat their stuff. Daniel decided to go against the flow, against the culture. I have a question for you. When you're watching TV or kind of dead scrolling on your smartphone, do you ever feel like you're just captured, you're just consumed by the culture? Like, I can't get away from it? I can't get away from it. I'm just looking and look. I can't get away from it. Our society tells us that we should all look a certain way, dress a certain way, keep our bodies a certain way, drive a certain kind of car. You know what? I was looking at this list of the best cars for 2024. I'm telling you what. It ain't nobody driving those cars. Oh, those cars, those cars are expensive. I mean, they're really, really expensive. I thought to myself, no, that they might say it's a car for 2024. But I'm never buying that car. I don't care what year it is. But that's the kind of culture that we live in. We have to drive a certain car. We have to live in a certain house. And honestly, honestly, though, sometimes it can be very easy to be consumed by the culture around us. And the best thing we can do, especially if we want to know God more, is to make a resolution not to be consumed by all that stuff. It's a distraction from becoming what God really wants us to be. We need to be like Daniel and resolve to go against the flow. This is what the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says this, Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. We need to resolve to be different, unique, in order to know God more. And the thing I think is really quite amazing about Daniel's resolve is in Daniel chapter 1, verse 12, it's kind of interesting. He says, please test your servants for 10 days. I wonder how he knew. Give us 10 days. Give us a week and three days. Watch us. In essence, Daniel's saying, let us live this countercultural lifestyle. Just watch and see what happens. Watch the results of being resolved. Actually, watch us do more than just say we're going to do something. Watch it happen. Then in Daniel chapter 1, verse 15, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better than any of the young men who ate the king's food. See, if you resolve to go against the flow, you'll be different. You'll be changed. It's, it's really undeniable. But what we've got to get past is just kind of this whole idea of making a resolution. It's not about making a resolution. It's about being resolved. 
So it's not just I say I'm going to do this. It's about transformation. That happens from the inside out. Every January, every January, millions of Americans brimming with optimism and a little extra belly from the holidays, they commemorate the new year by making a familiar urban trek. They go to the gym. And one in eight new members join the fitness club in January. And gyms, they'll tell you, they see this huge surge in people, anywhere from 30 to 50% in the first few weeks of the year. If you stop by your local gym after the 1st of January, you will see the ellipticals just all over the place going all the time. Everybody will be on an elliptical, new faces. But the next thing you know, it'll be April. And the gym cards will be mocking people from their wallets. Tummies will have once again sprouted like the trees, right? Gyms make most of their money from two sorts of people. One, absentee members. And two, super users, who not only pay like that monthly fee, but they pay for the add-ons, the trainers, the classes, all the way down to those little drinks that they mix that have the stuff in them that look like sludge. Unfortunately, unfortunately. Most of us fall into kind of the absentee member category. In January, our cup of willpower overfloweth. But by June, the odds that you've kept your New Year resolution fall to under 40%. Hopefully, hopefully, you're beginning to grasp a little bit of this idea of seeing real change in our lives. It's not about making resolutions. It's about how do I, how do I become Resolve. What's, what's that look like? Where do we get the power? Where do we get the strength to stay, to stay resolved? Paul points us to the power source for living a resolved life. He says this in 1 Corinthians. Paul wrote, for I resolve to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and pervasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Do you want to know how you get past just making a resolution? Know Jesus. Know the crucified Jesus. That's how you do it. That's where you begin. Know the one that we've been celebrating during the Christmas season. Paul tells us there in verse 3 through 5, ultimately it's not about our words, our talents, our abilities. It's about knowing Him. It's about being focused on Him. If you really want to be resolved, you want to be purposeful in connecting to the God who made the greatest resolution ever when He sent His only Son, Jesus, to the world. That's, that's the kind of resolution we're talking about. That's what it means to be resolved. As a senior in high school, um, I had the opportunity uh, to consider attending college <clears throat> and continue playing football. It wasn't a scholarship, but it was what I wanted. I made up my mind that nothing could detract me from that decision. But during the spring of my senior year in high school, my youth pastor, uh, Sky, Sky Allen, that's a great name for a youth pastor, Sky. Sky um, took our youth group across several states to visit different Christian colleges. And it was on one of the last nights of that trip, I recall walking across the campus of a Christian college, and I could hear the lyrics to a U2 song that was blaring out of some... Co now, that tells you that those guys are old, too. But I could, hear, I could hear the words from that U2 song kind of blaring out of someone's window in the dorm, and I was thinking to myself, huh... They actually listen to some pretty good music around here. I didn't know that. But it was a bus ride back to Chicagoland, and that suburb I grew up in where I realized that my self-centeredness was preventing me from seeing what God wanted for my life. I was so focused, so certain, so resolved that I was going to go to college and do what I wanted to do. I'd neglected to remember that God had sacrificed his own son for me. And in response, I was going to go play football for four more years. God, please forgive me, is what I wrote in my journal. I remember um, driving up I-57 
in Illinois. And I remember writing um, in my journal, God, please forgive me for being so incredibly selfish and only thinking of myself. If you're calling me to serve you like these kids I've met over this last week, I'll go wherever you want me to go. And that was huge. Because I knew I was on point. I, because I, I was truly resolved. God wants you to be resolved. What issues, what issues do you need to resolve in your life that are outstanding? Are there issues in your life where there's confusion, there's pain, destruction? Are there issues where you're going away from God's plan for your life? Or are you doing things to yourself that are taking you so far away from God's great plan that he has for you? You know, I said earlier that uh, being resolved, it's not a sprint, you know. Being resolved, it's a marathon. Being resolved means hanging in there for like the long run. It also means that when we fall, and most of us probably will somewhere along the way, we, we remain resolution, resolute. We remain determined. We, we won't stay down. We'll get up. We'll finish the race. That, that's what it means to be resolved. God, we look at the life of Daniel who made a commitment and was, a, and was willing to put his very life on display to the officials who had determined that they were going to mold him. They were going to squeeze him into the lifestyle of a Babylonian. A lifestyle that was the opposite of everything that he had learned, he had grown into being. And God, we face the same challenge. Lord, we live in a culture uh, that will squeeze us into its mold if we're not determined, if we're not focused, if we're not committed, if we're not resolved to become who you are inviting us to become. Lord, in this new year, may we as individuals, may we as a church, may we make the determination that no matter what, we won't be misshapen from the inside out. We won't be distracted from the inside out. We won't be fooled from the inside out into being anything other than what you are inviting and calling us to be as we live this life for you. Now, God, as we prepare to, to worship you, Lord, to give back to you, uh, Lord, we ask that you would be honored, you would be blessed, you would be pleased in what you see in our lives. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.